Welcome to Kiss the Reviews. I'm Armando. That's Corey. And today, we're doing 1985's St. Elmo's Fire. Recording live from Fraggle Rock. <laughs> Down at Fraggle Rock. I would rather be reviewing Fraggle Rock right now. Because <laughs> Gobo was the shit. Um... So before we get started, if you want to follow Corey or I on Twitter, you could follow me at Junior D's. You could follow Corey at Idle Poncho. Uh, and let's get into St. Elmo's Fire 1985. If we so, must. If we must. So this movie stars Emilio Estevez as Kirby, Rob Lowe as Billy, Andrew McCarthy as Kevin. Demi Moore as Jules, Judd Nelson as Alec, Ali Sheedy as Leslie, Mayor Winningham as Wendy, and Andy McDowell as Dale. For such a great cast, and you know, for for people that um, were into the Brat Pack, and this movie's a classic. Um, it's classically shitty. I'm just gonna put it out there. So this this movie is it follows seven friends, Alec, Billy, Jules, and the whole fuck along gang, gang. <laughs> and they're trying to navigate through life um, and their friendships after they graduate college. So the opening is them, you know, walking out, graduating Georgetown University, and. They're getting like real jobs and they're they're trying to adult. Yeah. Um and you you realize as as most people leaving college, I was in that that realm too. You're trying to adult, but you really don't know what adulting is. Like you have mm -hmm. no clue. <clears throat> um but my first impression of this was that they just it, like the script was so shallow and like skin yeah. deep. Yeah, exactly. This was it, which I mean, <clears throat> I guess you could make a case for the fact that that was the eighties is various shallow skin deep decade. Yes. Uh, however, I feel like the working title of this movie, again, I don't do research for this show. <laughs> so I, I imagine that the working title of this was either called white privilege or white people problems because <laughs> I, I was very conflicted in this movie because you can identify with at least one of the, what the seven characters are going through. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Everybody has a cliche or a stereotype that they followed coming right out of college. However, like you said, it's so unbelievably skinned. Nobody dives into anything. No. It takes the fucking climax of the movie to find out that Demi Moore's a piece of shit because her daddy didn't like her. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, no shit. And, you can yeah. tell by the way Demi Moore's acted through this whole thing. <laughs> she's got fucking daddy issues, for Christ's sakes. Yeah, and we'll we'll get into Jewel. So what I decided to do is, because this movie's kind of all over the place, mm -hmm. um, instead of doing like this chronological... Thing like we normally do, I just want to dive into each of these characters and we'll just we'll do it like that. So okay. that, it, it sounded like a better way to attack this movie. <laughs> Shay, man, shake it up. Gotta keep it fresh for the kiddos. But this movie opens up with them in a hospital because Rob Lowe, uh, Billy, and Wendy got into a drunk driving accident because Rob Lowe in this movie is a piece of shit. And he wants to relive the college days. And he, you know, he still wants to be in a frat and you do his frat thing. For some reason, Rob Lowe still has his saxophone and he's playing it in the ambulance to the nurse. And you get the line. You believe in premarital sex? <laughs> There's no context to, to that. Like, it's just random joke inserted here. And yeah, this... At, this He's like the best dad joke comedian that's ever existed. <laughs> and I love Rob Lowe. He's fantastic in this. He's fantastic in everything he does. Like, I don't want the negativity that I'm going to dump on this movie 
to reflect on the actors because they all do a great job with what they have. Oh, yeah, um, it's the characters in themselves that are shit, not the actors or their performance. But you can also tell that this is an 80s movie because of how everybody reacts to the drunk driving accident. Because mm-hmm. it's like, you have the one friend that is like, I can't believe that you got into you got into a car and drove drunk. And then everybody else is cracking jokes. Yep. And like, then, well, they're all right. <laughs> We're not going to talk about the other people. Our friends are okay. I have no fucking idea what happened to the people that weren't drunk driving. But exactly. fuck it. Yeah, apparently apparently they got this scene directly from Vince Neal's real life. So <laughs> Rob Lowe goes to jail, he gets bailed out by his friends, and then they immediately go to the St. Elmo's bar that they yeah. hung out at in college. Like, let's keep drinking. <laughs> and this is how you know your friend has a real problem. When it's nighttime and they go, I need a screwdriver. Somebody give me a screwdriver. No, you're a child still. (laughs) You are so addled if you're drinking screwdrivers past, what, 10 a.m.? You're right again. The only worst drink he could have ordered was an Alabama Slammer. Like, I need an Alabama Slammer. Dude, get the fuck, get a beer and shut the fuck up. What's your problem? Holy shit, I've had a rough day. <laughs> Apple teenies all around. I, I, I want to get into the Emilio Estevez character in this movie. As they're in the hospital, he sees a doctor that he, I guess, this, it's it's so like buried in that He took her to a movie once in college, and he's been in love with her ever since. Well, and, in love. Yes. This dude is about 10 years away from calling Jodie Foster and shooting the president. Dude, I'm telling you. It's, he's he's, fucking nuts. He's creepy as fuck in this movie. So he sees her, gets a boner in the ER, talks to her, and she's like, yeah, I vaguely remember you. Cool. And then he proceeds to stalk her to like a posh party where he's riding his bike. And I guess he's supposed to be like a lawyer or he's he's studying to be a lawyer still, but he's a a waiter. Sure. And you can see why, because he's fucking crazy. (laughs) They can't hold down real jobs like that. He's not serial killer crazy. He's obsessed crazy. Yeah. And then, so he follows her there, which I don't get this piece because He follows her to that party, and Mm -hmm. he's caught in the rain. He's dressed like a schmo. He walks into the fucking place. Everybody's, you know, suit and tie, and he's just dripping. And she's just like, what's going on? And he says, I'm obsessed. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go ahead and just call this uh, a two-part PSA. (laughs) All right? Hi, kids. Uncle Corey. Hey, ladies. When somebody is doing this to you, immediately seek help. Yes. Don't placate them. Don't continue to act like everything's okay. And if you're just nice, they'll get the point. They fucking won't. Yes. They will not get help, get restraining orders. Make sure you are covered. Second part of our PSA. (laughs) Hey, boys, don't fucking be this guy. This is gross. This is not how you get a lady. At yes. all. This is fucking gross. And it it's so unbelievably unhealthy. It doesn't Do show, not be this. It doesn't show them how much you care. It shows them the mental instability that you have. Dude, and this motherfucker is sniffing her pillows, bro. Her her reaction to him showing up like a fucking psycho at this party is to take him to her apartment where he's sniffing pillows. And And again, the roommate doesn't say anything to to Andy McDowell. You just caught this guy, not like, what the fuck is that smell? Oh, it's a pillow. He's like hugging it. Yes, he's (laughs) deeply inhaling this pillow. Dude, that's fucking weird. But then he invites her, he invites her to lunch and she blows she blows him off like she shows up and then she's got to leave because you know she's a doctor and then he invites her to this party 
for this house that he's working for this guy. They and... just trade jobs with this Korean guy. <laughs> yes. Like Billy works for him. Kirby works for him. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I worked for him at some point. Like everybody is working for this guy and then just throwing a huge party at his house. And all they do is fuck his wife and trash his house. And I'm pretty sure he's like a mobster or something. Well, they but... say that, but everybody lives and nobody has broken limbs. So I'm going to say uh, Kim is just pretty much on the level. Yeah. So he he has this party, invites her. She doesn't show up. So he drives to her apartment and is beeping a horn and yelling at them. And her roommate comes out. And then he threatens the roommate. Like, if you don't tell me where she is. Why should I tell you? Because I'm not responsible for what I'll do to you if you don't. I think the courts will see that differently. <laughs> um, you're going to have to go ahead and settle the fuck down and get the fuck out of here. I know I have so, a rotary telephone, but I could still dial 911 very quickly. And with, with new levels of technology in 2020, it's I'm assuming it would be a lot easier to stalk somebody. Um, it takes a lot of effort in 1985 to be this level, like he's big boss level stalker, okay? And he's leveled up Reminded multiple to times. Beat the shit out of women and fucking yeah. God knows so, what's everybody else. She basically just tells him she went skiing. He then drives all night and finds her little cabin that she's her boyfriend or her boy toy or whatever the hell he is. Finds them. It's a whole awkward exchange. He stays the night there. There's Ugh. no fucking way. <laughs> That guy is sleeping in my cabin. First off, there's no fucking way as Andy McDowell's boyfriend in this scenario. Yes. I'm helping this guy at all. He's yeah. like, leave me the fuck alone. Cool. Will do. <laughs> you actually, can stay out here and freeze. Actually, fuck. Knock on the door one time because I got six friends that are going to greet you. <laughs> you fuck. Like, just leave me alone, all right? Just get away from me and leave me alone. His great end of his arc is he kisses Andy McDowell. Yeah. And for some reason, she's into it, which, by the way, yeah. stalkers out there, they're never going to be into it. Don't do no. that. No. But he grabs her, kisses her. She's into it. And he just hysterically drives away like he's the fucking Joker. What? <laughs> the like, dude, this guy is literally fucking insane. He was so happy. <laughs> And they yeah. take, and her boyfriend or whatever takes a picture of them. And it's his like, idea. Hey, let's take a picture to commemorate the night the stalker came and met you. This is fucking, <laughs> this whole thing is a disaster <laughs> of an arc. So that's Kirby. And you're expecting us to feel good for him. <laughs> like, way to go, Kirby. You did it. Pew! High five. We, let's move over to Billy. Billy's a loser, can't hold a job. Everybody's getting him jobs. He's an alcoholic, and he continually fucks up not only his life, but he starts to fuck up other people in his like little friends group yeah. lives. But everybody just continually gives him a pass. Like, yes. here's another PSA. If you have a friend like this, cut bait. Because I know in this movie you know in an hour and 50 minutes or however long this movie was you know he's got a little like redemption arc and he's kind of getting his shit together but <sighs> cut him out of your life just do yourself yeah. a fucking favor so you don't and have to live through the the bullshit before they be redeem honest themselves let's be honest about it as well because you know you cut him out of your life we've been friends forever you're going to forget about that drug addict motherfucker <laughs> in about, I don't know, two weeks. Every yeah. now and again, Phil Collins will come on. You'll hear in, in the air tonight and you'll feel guilty for about 20 seconds because you're like, fuck, but he's dead in the gutter. And then you'll forget about it because you'll see a McDonald's or your kids are crying or whatever the fuck. <laughs> it doesn't but, matter. But his, his characters, like we find out in passing that he's married and has a kid and but he's dating Wendy and he's making out with Jules and you know he's trying to sexually assault Jules at his house because he moves Jeez. back in with his wife like it, 
He's just a fucking shit show. He wants to apparently be the saxophone player in the Lost Boys band because that's literally the only gig as a sax player you can get as a like as a professional musician. So oh, shit. And like literally that's his whole arc. Yeah, and you forgot about his obsession with uh, uh, Mayor Winningham's virginity. The way he gets it is saying, like, here's money that I owed you. Can I have a going away present? (laughs) Can I get a handy behind the couch? (laughs) Once again, what have you learned? You're a selfish dick throughout this whole movie. You get your shit together because you're working at an Amco station. And you talk jewels down off of, I don't know, suicide by hypothermia. (laughs) And (laughs) then... <laughs> a similar story happened to a young man in the Pacific Northwest about 20 years ago. And then you just you're like, I'm gonna. I would really appreciate your virginity if you don't mind. I don't have a flare up going right now, so it's safe. <laughs> and then I'm just gonna bail. I'm going to Hollywood to be a sax player or wherever the fuck he goes. I don't know. He took a bus somewhere. <laughs> Again, his arc is a disaster. Yes. There's, and, it's so shallow. And then they all are. Every character in this is. And then you have Alec and Leslie. They're dating. Alec, played by Judd Nelson, is was in like the Young Democrats Club or something in Georgetown. And then he becomes, he, he starts working for a Republican senator. Oh, and this is the power of money. That's it. He says, and he actually says, because Republicans pay more, that's why I'm doing it. And everybody's like all upset. And it's like, "Eh, first of all, it's politics. That's what happens. You're right. It's fact. Even though he thinks it's on the sly, everybody knows he's a piece of shit, including his his girlfriend, Leslie. And he's cheating on her. And he basically says the only reason he tells Andrew McCarthy, the only reason I'm cheating on her is because she won't marry me. And they're living together. And then once, and Andrew McCarthy's like, so once you get married, you'll just stop cheating. Like, I don't think that that's how that works. And it's not. Um, Um, And I'm going to go ahead and insert a quick (laughs) PSA here. Um, Hey kids, me again, (laughs) uncle Corey, just wanted to let you know that um, if you think you're slick and you're getting away with stuff, there's a really good chance you're not, you know, who gets away with things? Super paranoid people. Yes. Alec is not that guy. He thinks he is King Dick because he worked for a congressman and now he works for a senator and he's awesome. Yeah! And I will say say this about Alec and his character. He plays that role. If you've ever actually met these political operatives, Mm -hmm. he plays that role to a fucking T. Oh, he plays it perfectly. He's a psycho. And I don't mean like he's going to fucking like, ah, I'm going to stab you. I mean, like every, he has, he has no uh, responsibility. He's yeah. completely unaware of who or what he is doing yep. to other people around him. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, and his, his girlfriend, uh, Leslie played by Ali Sheedy, <sighs> Wants to find herself before she commits to Alec and marries him at the party that they're at. She basically says like, oh, you know, when you stop your extracurricular activities, then we can, you know. And he gets pissed at Andrew McCarthy because he thinks that he said something. And it's like, no, motherfucker, you are so obvious with your shit. She already knows. She was just throwing up a trial balloon just to see if it worked. And it did. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, she threw up the balloon and you went, fuck that balloon! Ah! <laughs> like, whoa, dude. Like, So, Kevin, who is Kirby's roommate, played by Andrew McCarthy, who is like the sensitive writer guy, he gets this job writing for a newspaper, and, you know, back in 85. That was relevant. And, yeah. uh, you know, a good paying job. And he kind of seems like at the beginning, he's the one that has his shit together. Like, it's almost like you were playing Clue at this point like we're just trying to guess who's got their shit together and the answer is nobody so i mean he's a writer and it's pretty standard because his character arc is really like through the most most of the movie is he's manic depressive 
Yes. Like, ah, love's stupid and love's for dickheads. And yeah. what's the meaning of life? Like, dude, you're such a fucking cliche. <laughs> Exactly. I literally never met a morose fucking writer in my life. We keep that shit internally and then put it on the page, you fucking well, jerks. And we later find out, like, because everybody thinks that he's gay. Like, that's the running joke in the movie is that everybody thinks he's gay. How come you never asked me if I want to date? Because I thought you were gay. Because what makes you think I'm gay? Well, I never see you with a woman and you're strange. That's not an indication of being gay. <laughs> What are you talking about? And you're strange? It's, that you just described Kirby to a T. <laughs> oh my god. Right. So, so I don't think you're gay. I think you're a stalker. Is what I think. Yeah, if that's the case, Kirby and Alec are leading the fucking pride parade this week. <laughs> so like Jesus. Everybody in like in their friends group like has the joke that they think that he's in love with Alec. But we find out later in the movie after the party. Uh, where Alec basically kicks Leslie out of their apartment, get your shit and get out of here. We find out that Kevin's been in love with Leslie this whole time, and she just goes, cool, uh, rebound sex, and he thinks that they're in love and they're in a relationship, and she was like, bro, we just, we, we just, we just fucked one time. Like, you need to, you need to where, pump the brakes. This is where Andrew McCartney starts turning into Kirby. Because, yeah. like, First of all, I didn't like the scene. Uh, they added too much to it because she saw the pictures of herself. Yeah. A la Love Actually, where it's like, oh, my God, you're in love with me this whole time. I never knew it. <laughs> That's my Kira Knightley. You're welcome. I, I like uh, it. So, I like it. So she's, Ali Sheedy sees the pictures and is like, oh, these are of me. And then it's like a quick edit and they're drinking brandy. And then he's like, I'm in love with you. No shit. We've seen the pictures. <laughs> We've seen the pictures, stalker. <laughs> it's just a, that added scene, yeah. And then and then he goes full board because they start kissing each other. And he is like – it's like when all these guys kiss their the person they're stalking or obsessed with. They just maniacally laugh. They just get all giggly and like <laughs> – Yeah. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I can't believe it's happening. That's not how you get a whap. Oh. I listen to Cardi B's song. That's not how you get that <laughs> Uh So after this, we let's get to Wendy because I literally wrote like three notes on Wendy. The first note is Wendy is pretty much insignificant in this movie. She has zero arc. Her family owns or like is in like the greeting card business that's like if in, it, that's like if in 2020 you were like yeah i own a string of blockbusters <laughs> who cares and like her her dad's giving her money and but he's like oh you need to date this fat guy because he's in the greeting card business too and like the, that whole storyline is just i was just like I got up and got something to drink because I just I really didn't care anytime she was on the screen. Like yeah, this is basically like her story arc through this is literally my big fat Greek wedding. Yes, basically. That's it. That's basically. all it is. Is my family's pressuring me to marry somebody, but they're pressuring me to marry somebody Jewish because they're also in the greeting card business and we're Jewish, so yay. Yeah. And it's just like every time her family's around, it's just massive Jewish stereotypes. I was talking to Betty's daughter. She moved into the new neighborhood. Only six Jewish families, but very wealthy. Every and minority in this is either in the welfare store, a hooker, <laughs> or just like the most obscene stereotype they could possibly make. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It was 1985, so. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Reagan, Reagan was kicking ass right now. <laughs> So, and then we get to Jules. It's really late. Let me drive you home. And waste all this good coke? Brace your fucking selves, people. So, we get to Jules, who apparently works at a bank. I mean, she's basically like a glorified clerk, but everybody treats her like she's like king shit, makes all this money. Come to find out, she, she doesn't. She's taken an advance on her pay for two months. First of all, I didn't even know you could do that shit. 
Second of all, apparently... Thank God we didn't know we could do that shit. <laughs> no shit. Apparently check cashing places weren't invented then. Because <laughs> she, she'd be in deep with fucking checking the oh. cash. <laughs> yeah. Her and Billy would have got shot robbing one of those. <laughs> And then she obviously has a very bad drug problem because it's the 80s and she does a lot of coke. And um, they make her friends make a couple of like super feeble attempts to have an intervention with her. And everybody's the whole thing is just like, well, that's Jules. Ba -ba -da. <laughs> OK, yeah, cool. Ali Sheen's character is literally the only one that really cares about Jules. Everybody well, else just likes watching her train wreck of a life and going. Ah, I guess mine's not so bad. And Ali Sheedy's character in this is the only like normal one that yes. is that's like take kind of taking a step back and going like, okay, I'm an adult, but I'm not really an adult yet. I need to figure out what's going on. I need to figure out who I am. I, you know, she's observing, and then she'll take some action. I feel much better now. Thanks. Yeah, she's the only one with empathy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's usually a great lead-in for, you know, death. Exactly. So they they make a an a feeble attempt to to intervene with her like screwing her boss and doing drugs at a soup kitchen. Okay. And then as you do, <laughs> she progressively gets worse. And then we see that her furniture has been repoed her her car's been repoed her jeep and now she's in like she she hasn't been she's been faking going to work for who you live by yourself who are you faking yeah. going to work like all her shit gets repoed and she locks herself in her apartment and is su suicidal okay this this isn't how suicide works by the way she opens all the windows. Listen, they have jackets on, but it's like September weather. I don't really think it's even winter at that point because they're all they all have light jackets on. Nobody like, okay, cool. It's 35, 40 degrees. It's gonna take you two months to die that way, just to let you know. But she just decides to open all the windows and sit and rock and shake. They finally get in and Rob Lowe, I guess this is his like redemption arc. I, I don't know, but he saves her by cracking a couple of fucking stupid jokes, and yeah. then he and tells and then, her they don't live in reality, which is yeah. always a smart thing to do to somebody who's potentially suicidal. <laughs> yes. Hey, and, none of this is real. Oh, cool! Yeah. I live in the Matrix. I'm gonna jump off this fucking building. And then you know he says the name of the movie, and okay, cool, everything's fine. Well, then he goes to, after this, like they're all friends again. And Alec and Kevin, they're walking with Leslie and she's got her arms around him like, hey, we're all going to be friends. And it doesn't matter that I slept with both of you. And and they're all like, oh, OK. And then they all walk to the bar, to the St. Elmo's bar. And they decide, oh, this this is a young kid's bar in college and we're adults. So I guess we'll go to fucking Applebee's because it's quieter there. And now we're a fucking we're adults. And that's how the goddamn movie ends. Uh, yeah. And we're overlooking the fact that um, Kevin and Alec decide that they still want to be friends, too. You just held me over a fucking balcony. And yes. threatened to kill me over a chick you were fucking cheating on. Yes. We got a lot to talk about. Yes. And the first thing that I'm going to say, I'm going to say it with my baseball bat. Because <laughs> fuck you. You held me over a balcony and threatened to and, kill me. And you didn't you even like. Sudge night? You guys need to You guys need to work through that before it's like, let's go have some beers. Like. Right. Whatever. But that's, I mean, that's how the movie ends. We're adults. Applebee's. Nobody's learned anything. Nobody's, yeah. you know, like Jules is a drug addict, okay? And she's she's constantly looking for for some coke from somebody. You yeah. you save her life and then you take her to a bar? That's your first move. Not to Betty Ford. The whole thing, dude, the whole like I got to look for a job tomorrow. 
Ah, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> They're laughing. <laughs> and just everybody just kind of like problems glanced off my shoulder. Problems yeah. glanced off. This isn't a fucking Taylor Swift song. <laughs> you guys are seriously fucked up and need psychological yeah. counseling and a ton of penicillin. Yeah. <laughs> there's yes. just there's so many problems. Yes. There with really this movie. is. It, the, the actors did a great job. Oh, they they're did, all they're all phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, everybody and if you're crying, they had real tears coming at, down their face. That's a big plus. You'd be surprised how many movies we watch now where just everybody's like, oh, I'm crying. No, you ain't, bitch. Hey, fucking eyes are dry as shit. Yeah! All the actors did a good job. It's just this movie played out like a novel. Yeah. This would have, I don't know if it's a book again. I don't research. So if this is a book, Cool news to me. It was probably a really good book because if this were a novel, it would have played out so much better. Yeah, the it just it was hard to translate uh, for a movie, it, especially over one hundred eight so, minutes, and it felt it, long. It it did feel long. I felt like it dragged on. Like it was a slow burn, but there was never a payoff at the end. No, exactly. Like, and and obviously, this movie for me does does not hold up. Um, I don't know why it was so popular in 85, but when I told a couple people that we were doing St. Elmo's Fire, they were like, ah, oh, cool, St. Elmo's Fire. And then I watched it and I was like, why were people so excited about that? Yeah. This this movie was boring. There mm-hmm. was nothing about any of the characters that made me give a shit about them. And no. this was, it was just, I said it before, it was just very skin deep and shallow. Like you didn't get, there was no depth to anybody. Yeah, the but, high school kids in The Breakfast Club had more depth and were more in touch with their feelings than these grown ass people were. Yeah, if you, if you want to watch a Brat Pack movie, watch that one. Like that's yeah. a great movie to watch. Um, but like the best part about this movie was the soundtrack, and I'll tell you what, I looked up the soundtrack, because I was like, oh, this, you know, it, during the movie, I was like, oh, good songs. Yeah. No, it's one song that they keep playing over and over again. The rest of the tr- soundtrack is like, mm, 80 songs. Like, <laughs> it's one <Yeah>. song. <laughs> so, yeah, and that it, was the best part of the movie. So, yeah, yeah with that said, like... If if you're looking for like an 80s movie, a Brat Pack movie to watch, choose another one. I would I would just skip this one. It's it's a waste of your time. Okay. No, the the only the only good character twist in this movie was Kevin, played by Andrew McCartney, where yeah. you find out he was in love with Ali Sheedy the whole time. Because they really yeah. lead you down the road that he is gay. And quite frankly, I would have rather seen his storyline being gay in the 80s. Yeah. And trying to come out of the closet to all these fucking uber psycho friends. Exactly. That would have that been... been a far more interesting story than like, no, I've always just loved you. Yeah. Okay. That cool. didn't work out, did it? No way. Uh, but do you have anything else for this movie, Corey? I do not. All right. Well, good. Me neither. So for Corey, I'm Armando. This is Kiss the Reviews, and this was 1985's St. Elmo's Fire. Twat us on Twitter.